Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. We will give everyone a few minutes before we get started, as always. Um, so we'll just kind of let everyone filter in and join. For those of you starting to join us right now, please make sure you tell us who you are and where you're from so we can say hi. And of course, as always, if you have questions along the way, please put them right there in this uh, pane that you see on the right hand of your screen that says comments. A couple of housekeeping reminders and updates that we always want to uh, go through and just kind of address, and it's important for me to talk about them, are a couple things. So the first and foremost is that this is an educational series. So as you guys know, this is Live with Liz. Um, today we're doing Lunch and Learn, where it's really intended for us to provide education, support, and advocacy around topics that are really important and oftentimes not talked about, but this is not intended to replace treatment. And so if you have specific treatment questions, we'll often defer you to a provider in your area. And we encourage everybody to be seeking your own individual treatment resources with a clinician who specializes in OCD, eating disorders, whatever you personally are dealing with uh, that needs to be addressed. If you're feeling unsafe or suicidal, please call the suicide prevention line, go to 911, call 911 or go to your local emergency room. As always, the IOCDF and this form is not a crisis line and this really is not the appropriate avenue if you are in urgent an urgent situation or your safety is at risk. Instead, we want you to take the steps below. We, of course, have some announcements like we always do. So the Faith in Mental Health Conference, I'm really excited to announce this. So we as IOCDF have really understood and recognized that there is a huge need to better educate the faith community around mental health and around OCD. And this has been even further confirmed by the registration we've had so far. So we've had amazing response so far um, with lots of people registered already for this conference. And so we would encourage you to please register if you feel like this would be something useful for you or a loved one. This conference is open to faith leaders, therapists, those with lived experiences, or anybody who thinks that they want to learn more about faith, anxiety, OCD, how they relate, and how we can best support those in those communities. Um, some of the sessions will be offered in Spanish, and it's really going to be focused on the intersection between faith and anxiety, faith and OCD, and related disorders. This conference will be virtual. It'll be a one-day event on May the 21st, so just in a couple months from 1 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. Please visit iocdf.org forward slash faith conference to register and learn more. We are continuing to um, push our survey to collect data for anxiety in athletes. So again, we talked a little bit about this last time, but Tom Smalley, one of our amazing lead advocates, is really taking on the anxiety and OCD with the athlete population um, initiative. And so we have a current survey that we're encouraging people to fill out and so that we can learn more about uh, what this community needs and what these, this community is looking for. And then of course, we are also doing an anxiety and faith-based survey to learn more about <clears throat> really how we can best serve these community members. It'd be great for you to fill this out, especially if you're interested in attending the conference so we can make sure our content is spot on and addressing the right things. As always, remember the Peace of Mind virtual community is where all of these events are hosted live through and under. You can go to iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind. This is where you're going to find all the live streams like this one, information about what's coming up, what we're doing, what we've been up to. It's where you can watch previous live streams, but it's also the place where you can submit questions. And so for those of you that are excited about a topic coming up or you know you have a couple questions you want us to address, please go to this uh, URL so that we can make sure we get those questions submitted and answered during our live events. Proposals for the IOCDF Annual Research Symposium are now being accepted. This event is going to be online on July the 8th and poster submissions are being accepted until April the 1st. You can go to iocdf.org forward slash research. I'm officially out of breath, so I uh, <laughs> had a lot of updates today, but all exciting ones. So good to see you. Hi, Brett. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Yulia. Um, wonderful to have everybody here and excited to really focus today 
on our topic. So today's topic is OCD and food related issues. We're gonna do a couple things. We're gonna walk through um, the difference between OCD and eating disorders, when disordered eating and OCD intersect, um, when eating is actually OCD and not an eating disorder, and of course, answer some general questions and hopefully give some good advice around best practices for treatment. Beth Brawley is joining us today. She is a licensed professional counselor in St. Louis, Missouri. At her private practice, she utilizes evidence-based treatments with individuals struggling with OCD, anxiety disorders, body-focused repetitive disorders, and comorbid eating disorders. Beth is a faculty member at the Brown School of Washington at Washington University in St. Louis, teaching graduate classes in ERP and behavioral therapies. We are so excited to have you join us, Beth. I know this is a topic that many of our viewers have a lot of questions about, are excited to learn about, and that we hope we can shed some light on because it's really important. So thank you for joining. We're excited to have you here. Thank you for having me, Liz. We um, get this question a lot, and so I'm just going to kind of dive right in. And the first question is, how do you differentiate you know, so we know what OCD is. We talk about that all the time. So um, unwanted intrusive thoughts followed by repetitive actions. And most of our viewers either live with OCD or treat or um, work with OCD in the OCD population. But it can be really confusing when we start to mm -hmm. see um, eating related obsessions or uh, body related obsessions and, and body image um, disruptions. And so I'm curious if you can just help define and eating disorder and how you would separate or differentiate OCD from eating disorders? Liz, that's a, that's a great question. It can be so confusing because, you know, we do see very similar experiences in OCD and in eating disorders. Um, I think about, you know, the OCD cycle where we experience an intrusive thought, um, we experience anxiety related to that thought, which then leads to a compulsive behavior of some type and then some temporary relief. We see this play out similarly in OCD and eating disorders, but we want to go back to our functional analysis question to learn what the behavior, what the function um, of the behavior is. What are we trying to um, avoid? So the, what are you worried would happen if you didn't engage in said behavior? And that can really help us identify, you know, is this coming from a place of OCD or is it coming more from a place um, of, eat, of an eating disorder? Um, and then, I can like give a little bit of information too. It's very much in a nutshell of the different eating disorders that you may see um, in your practices or you know in your experience um, and kind of the ways. And I know Liz, I think you said like we'll get into this um, in a bit too. But kind of the ways that they can play off of each other. Um, we see anorexia nervosa, um, that very restricted, limited intake of food. Um, I think you know this is part of some stigma that we can work on, you know, kind of dismantling of, you know, anyone who has anorexia looks a certain way, or you can tell what, you know, kind of uh, eating disorder people have just by looking at them. And that's absolutely not true. So with anorexia, you may see someone really unable to keep themselves at um, a healthy weight. Um, but largely what we're looking at in the differential diagnosis is that restricted intake. Um, and then there can be those compensatory behaviors to make up for, you know, whatever they did take in. Um, bulimia nervosa, we see um, that in terms of an um, period of time where there is a, a large quantity of food intake larger than what would typically be consumed by someone um, during that time. Um, and then we see those compensatory behaviors uh, that are coming in in terms of purging, fasting, uh, laxative or diuretic abuse. Um, and I, I don't want to get too much into these, but I do want to give this, you know, the information on, you know, some of the different different um, ways these will present in your practice. Um, we also see binge eating disorder, which I think is really great that we're talking more and more about this. Um, and I, I get the question of like, how are these two different bulimia nervosa than binge eating disorder? Um, so what we see with the binge eating disorder is there's less of the focus on the um, compensatory behaviors. Uh, we're seeing, you know, there's at least like one binge a week for three consecutive months, kind of looking at that. Um, and then we're kind of going to get into some of the more OC related food uh, food issues. So we have ARFID, avoidant uh, restrictive food intake disorder, um, and orthorexia. 
so orthorexia, I like to conceptualize this as really an OCD contamination case that, you know, really uh, fo heavy focus on um, the purity of, uh, of the food that, you know, someone is taking in. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, to say the least, of all of these different uh, ways you may see um, eating disorders present in your practice. Can you talk a little bit about ARFID and what it looks like in, like, clinically? Totally. So with ARFID, that avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So this is more along the lines of a food body related OCD. So if, uh, some examples of some cases that I've seen um, are, you know, I'm worried that I may choke on this food. I may choke and die. I may choke and throw up. Um, I'm afraid of throwing up. Maybe it's a texture. I don't feel like I can tolerate this specific texture or the taste. I can't tolerate eating something and not uh, liking it. Um, so there's a lot of fears around what could happen as a result of eating these fear foods, but it's not related to body image or weight or a fear of what would happen um, in terms of weight gain. So that's kind of how we're looking at the difference between anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder is more of that focus on uh, weight, body image, uh, the feeling of being fat or labeled as fat. Whereas with ARFID, we're not seeing, you don't see that in that way. And so I guess let's talk for a second about treatment. We know that treatment for both eating disorders and OCD is CBT focused, um, but it certainly looks different for eating disorders than it does for OCD. Can you talk a little bit, two things about A, what does treatment for eating disorders look like? And I would like us to highlight the time just because I think that's really important for us to kind of talk a little bit about how we know treatment for eating disorders tends to be a little bit longer of a trajectory than treatment for OCD. And then I would also love for us to talk about what treatment should look like when there's comorbidity. So we'll start with just eating disorders in general. Okay, so treatment in terms of eating disorders, I will highly, highly recommend and advocate for anyone treating an eating disorder to have other members of the treatment team. So a dietitian, um, the physician, the psychiatrist, getting those releases signed um, so that everybody can be, you know, on board and making sure that we are, you know, taking into account the uh, physical danger that eating disorders can lead an individual to experience. Um, so Liz, you're right. I mean, it's going to be very CBT based. Um, I think the the beauty, uh, if I can use that word here, is that we can use um, our ERP skills and knowledge to look at creating uh, hierarchies of food, um, fear hierarchies. Um, if there is a trauma component as well, that can also be addressed in terms of trauma food. Um, if the eating disorder does have a, a piece um, based on trauma, that can be a part of our hierarchy system and working with that. But I also think this is a pretty awesome opportunity to pull in values and to look at, you know, what is your eating disorder, uh, you know, in, how is it impacting your functioning in your life and the way that you want to be living your life and really pulling in um, that because sometimes, you know, what we'll see is that we talk a lot about how OCD is uh, ego dystonic. So it goes against how we view ourselves. It goes against um, our values. What and this is, you know, not for everyone, but with eating disorders, we can see more of an ego syntonic nature of these thoughts are um, on their own, not distressing. Um, but it's the idea of I need to, you know, I really need to obey these thoughts. Um, they're more in line with, you know, what I believe about myself or what I need to do. And so I think that can lead to some difficulty in terms of treatment. Um, I have had many an experience where someone may be more motivated to kind of get rid of their OC versus their eating disorder. Um, and so I think it's, that's where we want to pull in, you know, we're utilizing our ERP, we're utilizing CBT skills, and then looking at um, our mindfulness and willingness, and then our values and how, you know, we can use that as means to um, treat something that feels like it has really served us well in our past. Definitely. And and I think one of the questions that we would often get that I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on are how we treat them comorbidly. So one mm -hmm. of the things we've talked about, we've done a webinar recently is PTSD and OCD and kind of do you treat them together at once? Do you treat one first and then work on OCD? Like what does it look like? And I think obviously with eating disorders, as you just mentioned, there can be more acuity. 
and oftentimes a reason why the eating disorder would need to be managed before we're going to do OCD work, especially if we're talking about um, any sort of medical instability. But mm -hmm. I would love to hear your thoughts on how when someone's living with both and they're both disruptive to the individual, right? Mm -hmm. How do we kind of figure out a treatment plan? That's a really good question. I feel like it's a really um, intricate dance to play too of, you know, kind of keeping tabs on, you know, what is the higher priority right now? And, you know, we have to prioritize safety. Uh, we have to prioritize someone's, you know, health. And so if that, you know, if that is where someone is engaging in eating disorder behaviors that are, you know, very dangerous to themselves, whether it's, you know, purging, abusing, stimulants, laxatives, uh, whatever it may be that, you know, is something they need to address now, they may be more willing or wanting to address some of the OCD, but we have to have some of that medical stability uh, first and foremost. And that's something we can also kind of use as a carrot, if you will, of, you know, as, as we get this, these uh, more eating disorder behavior stabilized, we're going to be able to work on the OCD uh, more so in the way that you presented wanting to do. So I think that's where a lot of psycho ed with our clients also comes into place of, you know, we're not going to symptom swap here. So if, you know, you're, we're seeing that, oh, well, my eating disorder behaviors have diminished, but I'm like ritualizing in my OCD, uh, you know, all the time. Well, that's not, that's obviously not ideal. So I think it's a consistent checking in with both OCD and eating disorder, creating the hierarchy with both OCD and eating disorder related um exposures and the bands, including eating disorder bands and OCD bands. Um, but kind of looking at, I mean, what I say is that if we just go after one and not the other, well, then the one we didn't treat will pull the other back in. Right. So it is consistently uh, checking in with how things are going and going from there. Right. You know, if someone has a comorbid condition of OCD and anything, right, it doesn't matter really if it's depression, if it's eating disorder, if it's yes. PTSD, we can't just ignore one and move on to the other. You know, we do need to be checking in. Um, and so that leads to one of my final questions before we hop into questions posted, which is how do we like when is eating? So you talked a little bit about this with orthorexia and others, but like or contaminated contamination that turns into or looks like an eating disorder, at what point do we kind of treat it as OCD versus treating it as an eating disorder? So is the question like specifically about like those more contamination cases like with orthorexia? Yeah, or like I'm thinking of like, you know, if you have a patient where it's more clear OCD in the sense that they aren't eating anything that's not prepackaged because of fear of getting sick or poisoning mm -hmm. someone and the food being contaminated, whatever it might be. However, it also has led to them having a low BMI and has led to different disruptions. So it also presents clinically as disordered eating or as problematic, mm -hmm. how do we kind of, what, what, what does treatment look like? Because it may not be traditional ERP, like we still may need them seeing a nutritionist and need them to yes. have a full team. Yes, exactly. Um, and I think that's where it's, you know, almost like looking beyond in this moment, does this seem like OCD or eating disorder and looking at you know, functionally, who needs to, I mean, like you said, Liz, who needs to be a part of the team right now um, to have an increase in the stability? Um, and then, you know, maybe titrating back on uh, other treatment um, providers on the team based on how your client is doing. Um, yeah. And working together, you know, and I think that that's a really critical piece that Beth brings up that really it's for any diagnosis you deal with, right? Even if you have clear just OCD, but you have a psychiatrist and a psychologist, it's important that they're communicating, right? It's important that we're working together. The more interdisciplinary, so the bigger your team becomes because you have a nutritionist as well, or a dietitian, or an eating disorder specialist and an OCD provider, the more critical it is for us to be working together. I mean, I talk about this all the time, especially even with kiddos, right? Like I want the school counselor involved. I want the parents involved yes. because that's the team, right? The team yes. doesn't consist of just the provider and it's important that we're communicating well together. Absolutely. I think it's seeing every member of the person's system as a crucial needed um, piece of support. And obviously we know that if that's not there, it does make the situation harder um, right. for clinicians or you know, for the person actually receiving the treatment. 
So one of the big things I would love us to address really quick, because I think it's important, is some of the differences in ERP treatment for OCD compared to treatment for eating disorders. So one of the things I talk a lot about with patients who deal with, for example, BDD, is that when, when we're doing OCD treatment, it's often all uncertainty based, right? Let's lean into uncertainty, let's push uncertainty, let's really be willing to feel uncomfortable. With say body dysmorphic disorder, it's not as much, right? It is, it is certainly still kind of CBT based, but we're not doing as much of like, you know, oh, maybe, maybe my nose is distorted and maybe there is something wrong with me because that can really increase depression, right? Mm-hmm. Instead, it's kind of that we often will also incorporate self-compassion and other things. And so I would just love to hear how CBT for eating disorders looks a little bit different than traditional ERP for OCD, right? ERP for mm-hmm. OCD is more of like, we push worst case scenarios, we lean in, we feel uncertain. We're not going to do that with eating disorders, right? We're not going to like purposely push that like, oh yes, I do look really overweight and like, I, right, like that's not helpful. Yes. So can you talk yes. a little bit about the clear differences in treatment? Yeah. Well, one uh, one thing, one thing that one one thing I really love to go after with this is that idea of really radical acceptance and utilizing, like you said, the compassion, the mindfulness along mindfulness alongside this. So really working to remove um, moral based judgment labels um, about either food, bad food, good food, healthy food, junk food, removing those labels and looking at it's really this moral like neutral ground. But then also looking at, like you said, I'm not going to have them lean into the fear in that way, but we'll look at, you know, what is the purpose of you having a body in this life and how does your body help you function in your life the way you want to? Um, How does your body help you uh, do the things that are values based in your life? Um, And then looking at how do we, again, like accept what is rather than what we think should be or what society tells us should be. Um, so it, I think it goes more towards that acceptance piece and like this moral neutral ground. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think it's really important. And I think it's critical that, you know, I think sometimes when we live with OCD, I was actually talking to a good friend about this last night, even for myself, like sometimes when I'm just experiencing general anxiety or um, things in life that are totally normal, but cause uncertainty or anxiety, I automatically sometimes label it as OCD and want to go down that, like, or not what to, but think, well, I should go down. This is how I should address it. And it's important that we differentiate, right? When is it OCD? Mm-hmm. When is it eating disorder? How should I appropriately address this? Because acceptance is very different than active ERP or active yes. uncertainty statements and the outcomes will, will be very different. Yes. So I'm not going to ask my client who's having, you know, more eating disorder, body focused thought of like, I I look disgusting and no one will accept me. I'm really not going to have them be like, let's sit into that. And, you know, or let's sit in that and be like, yeah, you're so disgusting. Um, But looking at more of, you know, what do I want to create for myself in this moment? And how can I actively show myself gentle, loving kindness in the way that I would for someone else? Right. Right. And it's interesting because that's where some of the overlap is, right? That even with ERP, when we push uncertainty for OCD, it should still be values based, right? And we're really Mm -hmm. still teaching you that like, okay, you feel uncomfortable and you can still choose to live this life or you can still Mm -hmm. choose to make these decisions or live this certain way. And so there is certainly overlap, but there are some clear differentiators that are important Mm -hmm. for us to always Mm -hmm. keep in mind. Yes. Um, okay, so there's a couple questions, and we'll kind of hop into that one. Um, one person said, just thank you for doing this. I'm a therapist, but have a son with OCD, and a lot of it centers around food. So this is very helpful. Mm. Um, texture tree, I, I'm going to answer kind of your question quickly, which is just or just respond to say, I'm sorry that it sounds like disclosing OCD has been difficult and that you haven't had a great reaction from a family member. What I will tell you is advocate for yourself. And if you know, right, that that you're struggling and that you need help, work to find the resources you need to take care of yourself, even if family members don't see that. Sometimes family members struggle with understanding mental health, understanding the help that we need. No one knows the help that you need like you do. And so it's important to advocate for yourself. Um, But I wish you had some more support. The great news is places like IOCDF can help support you in that path to finding a good resource. Um, So one person asked about 
um, I'm taking medications, uh, but continue to struggle with reading and writing. What I would encourage, this is where I would encourage ERP, right? So remember guys that medication often can be very helpful, but it, it's utilized for OCD alongside ERP and alongside CBT. So it's really important that you're seeing an OCD specialist coming up with a treatment plan and doing active ERP for our OCD struggles because we're not gonna necessarily just see medication get rid of everything overall. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our questions from Brett at 1120 Chelsea is when OCD interferes with eating in terms of rituals around all food, if I eat a full bite, something bad might happen, et cetera, and it's impending weight gain, how would you move forward with ERP and treatment? It's not contamination and it's not a specific food and it's not body image related. So the fear is that if I, if I eat this, then something bad could happen and that also does include weight gain. It sounds like it's it's impeding weight gain. Oh, 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 okay. Okay. So, I mean, I would be curious about, I mean, is it a specific fear or is it maybe that like that just right feeling or not getting that just right feeling um, related to something bad could happen. Um, but then looking at uh, put those foods on, I mean, I'm going to go to that hierarchy and, and look at, you know, I love doing food exposures with clients too. And I think, you know, uh, one cool thing about uh, doing telehealth right now is that it is a little bit more accessible to having like snacks or meals with people. So this could be something um, that they could bring up with their therapist of maybe doing some exposures together uh, related to food and, you know, looking at some expectancy violation here of I can tolerate more than I thought I could um, with purposefully eating foods that uh, anxiety does not want you to. Yep. So really, when you think about it, it's all about um, coming up with a specific treatment plan for you, right? So if you and your provider agree this is this is OCD, right, and that this is OCD fears, it's about doing those active exposures together. And so what is the goal? Well, the goal is eating non-full bites. The goal is eating full bites. The goal is eating everything and sitting with the thoughts, right, leaning into the uncertainty around the thoughts while doing this feared action. And I, I think Beth is so right. There's been so much negative to COVID. <laughs> there's no doubt we all feel that. Um, but there's been some silver lining. And one of them is the opportunity when we're virtual to do more active exposures, like eating exposures together. Um, and that's something that certainly we couldn't do if you were in person wearing masks. And so it's, it's a great benefit for sure. Um, the next question is, uh, yeah, so, so it sounds like for that specific fear, the fear is that something bad will happen, like um, someone might die. And so, again, mm -hmm. it sounds like that's when it may be a little bit more clear this is an OCD fear, mm -hmm. but how do, you know, how, we still want to push it and push them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would advocate too showing yourself compassion for the hard work that you're doing with like, that is an intense fear. Um, and especially looking at how I can honor and respect my body, um, that my body needs to have this food. And I'm going to let myself do that while sitting and tolerating this fear. Exactly right. Um, again, those values based things, right? Eating's important, eating's nourishment, OCD's impacting it. How do we treat both? Um, the last question is Is there anything a parent can do to prevent or reduce the likelihood of an eating disorder developing in a preteen girl with OCD? She's actively being treated and doing well now. Okay, well, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> I'm about it. I'm like, so, what a great mom you are to have. <laughs> this insight and proactive kind of desire to, you know, for bad outcomes. Yes. I mean, for that, I mean, there's so many places my brain wants to go with that. Of, I mean, first off, the like, like Liz said, like, that's awesome just to have that awareness of like, what can I do to help this loved one of mine, you know, not even have to deal with this. Um, and I go back to what I said a little bit earlier about making food a neutral um, experience in terms of like the way we talk about it. So of course, like, there's going to be so much of our socializing revolves around food. Um, and so it's something that, you know, I'm not saying don't take joy in, but what I'm saying is like when we talk about it or when we're talking about, um, you know, what we're going to eat tonight or uh, what did you eat for lunch today? Really getting rid of labels such as good or bad, junk food, healthy food, um, really having this idea, this intuitive eating um, idea of all food fits and our body knows what to do with food. And so, moving away from dialogue around uh, the moral value of food, but then also kind of looking at the dialogue around bodies being more about 
look at all the ways your body is amazing and helping you with the things you want to do in life. Uh, you played your soccer game today and like, that's awesome that your legs were able to carry you up and down the field as opposed to, um, comments about, you know, the way my legs look today. Um, and I think that's where like the whole family can be on board too, of everybody kind of being on that same page, um, to make a commitment to the way we're talking about our bodies being from a more compassionate place, um, instead of coming from like, again, what society tells us we, we need to be doing with our bodies. It's interesting because I um, talk about this a lot with OCD that I think we're always our worst critic. And for those of us with OCD, like I know myself, I'm the first to come to therapy and say like, okay, so this week, this is what I didn't do. <laughs> like, this is where I struggled and this is what I need to address versus, hey, can you like take a step back and acknowledge all the things you did do? And the fact that like you still showed up to work despite feeling uncomfortable or that you still accomplished this despite having a trigger. And I think you know, this is where, you know, Beth, one of the things we've talked about recently is just the need for us discussing self-compassion so much mm -hmm. more openly mm -hmm. and radically in our field and where we can just see and hear how important and critical it is when we're talking about eating disorders or we're talking about OCD around eating um, and just the shift, right? The shift of it being like, I'm doing well or I'm doing bad. I'm struggling mm -hmm. or I'm, you know, I'm on cloud nine, but instead like, what what did your body do for you and like like just hearing the self-compassion and it's so easy for me to be like oh yeah that's so critical and that's so important but it's so hard for a lot of us to practice mm -hmm. and to get to to that place liz in terms of what i have my clients do to start practicing that is kind of put them on a one-to-one -one ratio so for every like negative or critical comment about your body or about food um i need you to combat that with a statement of neutrality and compassion for yourself and for your experience so I think that's a, a cool way I've had not only my clients, but also their family start to practice this um, so that it gets easier. It's more kind of streamlined into just the, the system that they're in, the way they talk about themselves and the world around them. So, yeah. yeah. A hundred percent. Well, that, that wraps up the questions that we have for today. Um, and I agree. I agree, Felice. You said we need more intensive outpatient. The wait lists are long. We need more treatment overall. We need more outpatient. We yes. need more residential. We need more intensive. Um, yes, there are long wait lists and there's limited uh, providers that really specialize in OCD and in particular OCD and eating disorders or OCD and comorbid conditions. So Beth, thank you for your education and knowledge and sharing it with us today because I know it is useful for so many. And I think the takeaways for today, at least from my perspective, are that eating disorders and OCD are very often comorbid. Uh, it's important that you see a specialist who can help differentiate, is this OCD, is this your eating disorder? And that it's really critical you have an entire treatment team. Mm -hmm. Whatever that looks like for you, depending on what your struggles are, that there's a strong team that can address everything going on and that's working collaboratively together versus ever unintentionally oftentimes against one another, right? That, that that's really important. Totally agree, Liz. Thank so, you for having me. It's our pleasure. Thank you for joining. And we look forward to the next Launch and Learn, which will be in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, make sure you guys check out iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind for all of our upcoming events. And we will see you there.